Unlocking your unique potential. It's, it's what God has given you. This entire series is about what God has done uniquely on the inside of each one of us. And this series, today we're in part 11 of this series, but um, part 11 of the series, but number seven of the motivational gifts. I know that's a lot going on there with all the numbers and everything. I apologize. I should have never let this get this long. I should have... <laughs> broke this up into a couple of different titles or something, but number 11 today, this is the 11th Sunday that we've been back to this year, and we're still in the same series, but this is what God has given us to talk about, unlocking your unique potential. So far, how many of you, this has been meaningful to you, um, for you personally in your life, the things that you've been doing for the last two months How many of you have actually benefited from the messages that are going on on um, Sunday morning? Just give me a wave of your hand. If you're online, um, just give me some hands or something so I can see. Uh, Also, thank you for joining us, Bishop Muhindi. We we are always grateful. Um, He says he lets us know they're in the room, and uh, we're always praying for them. Um, we, you prayed with us last week, you remember, uh, for their loss of Beatrice's father. We just thank you for being so included and involved. Uh, we've been supporting them for years, and that's our intention. We believe that God has given us the ability to do that, and uh, it's, it's part of who we are and what we support in the work that they do where they are. But thank you again, uh, Bishop Muhindi. And um, thank you for all of you who are online and, and your responses. God bless you. Um, but this, this message, unlocking your unique potential, I hope that it will not just be a message or a series, but I hope that you will realize that God, your creator, my creator, the creator of the universe, that first of all, can you imagine that the creator of the universe that put... Saturn, where it is, is the same God that created you and what's on the inside of you. And what, sometimes what we don't realize is Saturn is there for us. We, God had us in mind. God had you in mind. And so in what, one of the things that God did is he put on the inside of you some unique treasures that he wants you to share with everybody else, all these people on earth. How many people on earth today? Somewhere about seven billion, some, how many, who knows? Is there, did we, about seven billion? I thought we were getting close. I remember when it was six. It takes a while, but about seven billion people living on the earth today, and God puts gifts and special things on the inside of each one of us so that we can each bring joy and what God has put in us to someone else. That's, that's just amazing to me. And that's the unique grace. We, we sang the song about amazing grace. One of the things about, that is so amazing about grace is that grace is unique. It, it just, the mix of what's on the inside of you is different than the mix of what's on the inside of me, and it brings out the unique talent, the unique skill, the unique abilities, whatever it is that God has planted on the inside of me. And when it comes out as fruit, we all have all this fruit that everybody else needs. It's not necessarily for you to eat your own fruit. You need the, <laughs> you need the fruit from somebody else's tree. <laughs> and if you eat your own fruit, you're probably not as healthy as you need to be. <laughs> And so we all need to be producing fruit, but really it is for somebody else. And today, we're, in the last, we're on the last one of the seven motivational gifts, and it's about all love. It's all about love, and that's part of your potential, part of what God is doing on the inside of you. You see, when we think about love, and that's what I was talking about, grace, when we think about God's love, we have to realize that God's love is personal. God loves me. See, I realize that God loves me as if I was the only person on earth. I told somebody the other day, I said, man, I just, I was telling them about an experience I had, and it just lets me know that God 
loves me, but I, 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 you know what? I think he likes me. I don't know what you think, but I think he likes me. And this, I told this person this the other day because um, I had, there's old technology and new technology. I needed some, some old technology that I had about 10 years ago to do something in, at my work. And so I had this, how many of you know what a PCMCIA card is? All right, so, you know, that's kind of old technology. We have one person in the room. <laughs> so I needed a, a PCMCIA card reader that I could connect to my laptop with a USB cable. And I know I purchased one about 10 years ago. And we needed one at work. And I, I said, well, I have one. But then after I said that, I was like, oh, my God, I don't know where that thing is. Where could it be? So I'm sitting at my desk at home doing something else, not even thinking about that. And I just, see, this is how I say it because nobody spoke to me. No, I didn't hear anybody say anything. I just looked across the room and I have this little box that actually it's a little box that my wife and I take when we go on vacation. So we, I can, like, if I want, I don't want to watch what they're showing on the, you know, at the hotel, I can put in my fire stick or whatever. So I have this box that I have these things in. And I just had this impression to open this box. So I open the box and there's the PCMCIA card reader that I needed. I was like, Holy Spirit, come on. This, you're just so, so good. And, and so I told him, when I was telling the person this, this story the other day, I said, so I think he likes me. I am sure. But God likes you too. God's love for you is personal. Yet you know within yourself you are not perfect. You know all of your situations, even those that you hide from everybody else. God, and you know God knows all about that. But at the same time, he does not reduce the intensity of his love for you. As much as you have messed up, as much as you, as many people as you have hurt. How many of you have hurt some people before? As many people as you have hurt. And as many people, some of them still don't like you. But then God still loves you with the same intensity that he loves everybody else as if you were personally the only person um, that he has love for. But knowing this and knowing how God sees you and knowing how he sees how real you are and all the things that's going on, he wants you, this gives you the freedom. This is what gives you the freedom. This is what grace actually does is when you really realize that, it gives you the freedom to respond. It gives you the freedom to um, be proactive. You don't have to wait. You can do, you have, you realize you have talents and resources on the inside of you that God created you for a purpose. And somehow that purpose is related to you releasing the love that God has for you on the inside as you release that to others. And so when we think about, you know, sometimes we think about purpose and we think, that, okay, that's kind of heavy. I don't really know what my purpose is. I don't have any connection to my purpose with my job or with anything that I think about. But here's one thing I want you to realize. Whatever your purpose is, your over, God's overarching purpose is for you to impact the hearts of others with the unique expression of love that he's put on the inside of you. You, you have a unique expression of God's love and God's overarching purpose is for you to release that. People need that. Somebody in your orbit needs that. And you need to release it. Your unique, your unique expression of love, it's, it's fundamental. It's the, it's the building blocks for whatever it is that's on the inside of you, even as you discover your purpose. You know, it's some, when we look for our purposes, sometimes... You don't realize you're in your purpose until you look in the rearview mirror and say, oh, that's what I've been doing and that's what I have been called to do. And when you put it all together, it's amazing when you understand that God's love for you 
is so massive and he thinks of you personally, but at the same time, he wants you to release that love. It, well, really, it's your response to his love. He wants you to release that response to others because they need that responsiveness from you. Uh, um, this message today is challenging us to do a couple of things. It's challenging us to intentionally work on our relationships. Tell somebody close to you, we need to work on our relationships. <laughs> we need to work on our relationships. You see, something has happened with our relationships in the last few years, and I know COVID had a big thing to do with that, um, but put the political environment and climate and all, everything, we seems like we just stop working on relationships. We just let them just be. And whatever happens, happens. Um, but they don't just get better by themselves. You got to nurture them. You got even, even known relationships like husband, wife, it's not like, well, you know I'm your husband, so you know I love you, and you know I provide for you. You need to realize that you need to nurture that relationship just like you would nurture of a newborn baby who needs certain things based on who they are. So based on the relationship that you have with different people, you need to learn how to nurture each person based on who they are to you. Because God's main goal is that everybody receives some degree and some form of the love from him that comes through you. That's, that's amazing today. So I have some questions for you. You ready? Okay, so if you're online, get ready to vote A, B, or C. How many close friends do you have? Close friends. So <laughs> A, less than two. B, two or more, or C, three or more? How many of you have three or more close friends? Okay. Mm. How many of you have less than two close friends? Mm. Mm. So we have some work to do. <laughs> Um, if A was your normal answer, you're not in a boat by yourself. Um, you have a lot of company. Actually, you would see my face in that same boat. Um, and I, especially, you know, a few years ago, I had to work at this. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit today, but... Oh, let me just ask you the next question. That'll help me out. So can you talk about one or two things that make it easier to neglect friendships today than 15, 20 years ago? What are some of the things happening today, to today that makes it easier not to have close friends? Boy, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> I wasn't ready. That one definitely knocked me down. Boom. Uh, okay. Kids, what else? COVID? People, social media, work. Okay. <laughs> Getting older. Okay. Different age group, different people, different, uh, okay. Uh, I'm waiting to see some responses online here. They're a couple of minutes behind us, but, um, you know, I, I realize all of those answers are, you know, you can't have a wrong answer to this question, you know, um, friendships and why we can't nurture friendships. But one of the one that, that is probably more common with all of us, well, let's talk about this. How many of you think you are an introvert? How many of you think you may be extrovert? 
How many of you don't know what those verts are? <laughs> okay, so an introvert type of person is a person who pretty much likes to stay by themselves. They are inward. They're not very expressive. Many times you'll see them, they're kind of quiet. They'd rather be by themselves than with the crowd. An extrovert means that that's a person who loves people, loves to be outward. They're outgoing. They're fun to be with, and they're very expressive. So you have those two opposites. And sometimes, so how many extroverts we have in the room? Okay. And you know it. (laughs) And one of the things that happen is when we talk about friendships is sometimes the introverts will feel like they can't be as expressive as an extrovert. So they feel like they don't need to put forth that much energy since, you know, I'm an introvert and I, I just like my wife is an extrovert and I'm an introvert. How many of you knew I was an introvert? Oh, well, really? Okay. So (laughs) my wife's an extrovert and I'm an introvert. If we are talking, especially if you ever, if you remember this one guy said, if I could just be on a fly on the wall just to watch y'all argue. He said, oh, it was, it would be a show. But I know I cannot out talk my wife. I know from the beginning of a conversation, I need to just listen, not give in. I won't give in. Listen. It's important not to give in, even if you're an introvert. It's important to listen and wait because you got two different dynamics that's going on, but if you, don't, if you don't work out how to work with each other, then you will just give in. And giving in, if you're an introvert, means that you are just turning inward and you don't say anything. Now, I, that's been a habit for me sometimes where I just shut down. How many of you sometimes just shut down? It's like, okay, boom. And he's saying nothing. And that just makes it worse, right? Okay. So what we're talking about in this message today is the, the seventh motivational gift, which is the motivational gift of a compassionate person. One thing that I haven't talked a lot about for all of these motivational gifts is they all represent some part of the body. You know, one, one, at one place, Paul says, we, you know, we're all different parts of the body. So if you're a perceiver, I think I asked this question, and you said the perceiver is the eyes of the body, and the server is the hands of the body. The giver is, are, is the arms of the body. The, who did I miss? The, the administrator is the shoulders of the body. And exhorter, the exhorter is the mouth of the body. <laughs> Always mouthy. And is there only the teacher? What part of the body is the teacher? The brain, the brain. And so the only one left is the one we're talking about today, and that's the compassionate person. You know what part of the body the compassionate person is? It's the heart of the body. And over all the years that um, Pastor Thomasine and I have been doing these surveys, and we've done hundreds and hundreds of people, if we look at all of the surveys and the results as far as people, the top three motivational gifts, the compassionate person shows up more than any other gift. And that same um, data is represented in the studies that were done before I started collecting. And one of the reasons that the authors of this book talks about and the reason that is true is because they believe that we need more love in the body than anything else. We need to learn how to be friends. We need to learn how to, um, and and even when you say that, because when you say learn how to be friends, you know, that depends on 
what a friend has been like in your past and not necessarily what it's been like in my past. But I want to show you something today. The first scripture we want to look at is the one we've been looking at where it, all of the seven motivational gifts were Paul in Romans, the 12th chapter. He talked about if you, know, if you were this gift. So today we're talking about if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, what did he say? Do it gladly. So some people have the motivational gift of actually being kind. And, and that word kind in other translations, I want to show you one other translation where it's a little different. And in, in the Message Bible, it says, if you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Now, this is for people, certain people have a gift for actually being kind, being loving in almost any situation and any circumstance. That's what this, this gift is all about. It's a compassionate person. It's the last one in the seven motivational gifts that we're talking about. It is, it is a person who can show mercy. And so when we look at this today, um, you know, I just want to point out some of the words that we mentioned here. This is the part that sometimes we don't look at. If you are that kind of person, he's saying, don't let yourself get irritated. How many of you, it's easy for you to get irritated with people? <laughs> I didn't even finish the question. <laughs> Hands are irritated with people. Or one of the things that can happen, you can become depressed if you're dealing with people who are depressed. And so he's saying, the scripture is saying, don't allow yourself to do this. Keep a smile on your face. And this is not just saying a fake smile. It's saying, do, you know, it's saying a smile that actually is, you know, motivated by something from the inside. And we're going to talk about one thing that a, a smile is powerful. Sometimes you don't realize how powerful a smile is. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But let's talk about the, some of the characteristics of the compassionate person. First of all, they have a tremendous capacity to show love. And that's what I mean by almost in any situation, in any circumstance, even if you treat them bad, they have this tremendous capacity to show love. They always look for good. That's why it's, it's almost like the complimentary of, uh, of um, what kind of person that looks for what's wrong? <laughs> the perceiver, yes. The perceiver, they have the gift to find out, to find stuff that just ain't right. It just sticks out to them. For the compassionate person, they can find the good in any bad thing they and they they also they're always looking for the good they avoid hurting others those are some of the you know the the uh, traits they avoid conflicts and confrontations how many of you hate conflicts hate confrontations and you back away from them and you shut down and you do all kinds of stuff I, um, they don't like to be rushed that's amazing isn't it and one thing that's not on here, they're typically slow. They're typically slow, but don't like to be rushed. So leave them alone. Anyway, they're also a crusader for good causes. Uh, if you want, you know, if you got a good cause, you have somebody with this motivational gift, they'll be your top leader, your cheerleader. Your, they're ready for it. Um, they also rejoice to see other people succeed. They're ruled by their heart. Oh, heart, 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 not their head. So sometimes they need somebody to help them so that you can combine the two. Uh, they're, they have affectionate nature. Their affectionate nature is often misinterpreted by the opposite sex. So when we understand this and we realize that that's the gift we have, 
then we can actually manage our own selves, our own emotions better to the point where we realize we could be misinterpreted and we can take steps that would actually keep us from being doing that. But, so let's look at the word compassionate person. You obviously see the word passion in that word, right? And passion is a word that really just means strong emotions and strong feelings. And so it's not necessarily whether it's, whether it's good or bad. In other words, passionate could be love or hate. So if you are a compassionate person, you have all this, this ability to love, but if anybody ever pushed the wrong button, it's like explosive. It's it's um I can only remember just a couple times in my life where I have been there. Yes. You don't want to you don't want to take a compassionate person there. <laughs> you don't want to take a comp- cuz it's passion and they have they have the gift Just think about it. It's a gift that God has given them. You don't want. So don't just keep pushing a button. (laughs) Don't don't do that. Uh, Another thing, sexual desires, lust, strong love. And sometimes we even look at the word lust and we've associated it with uh, sex so much. But lust could be for anything, but it's just an inordinate desire. Since a compassionate person has a strong passion, they have the ability to have strong passion, it could be for anything. And so I want to, sh- I want to pull out three words here that makes up a compassionate person. And we, you've heard these words before. You've seen them. Sympathy, ep- empathy, and compassion. It takes all three of these. And I know, you know, I could invite my wife and a couple other therapists in this room to come up and help me with these, <laughs> but um, I'm going to try to do this by myself and be, try to be a big boy here. But let's look at the first one, sympathy, because I'm going to show you a story in scripture where all of these words pop out at you, Okay. So sympathy is feeling sorry for some, you know, what a person is experiencing. You feel sorry for them. Um, you know, you are not necessarily ex- you experiencing their pain, but you're experiencing their pain from your perspective. Sympathy really is all about you. And I know you're like, really? Have you ever said, you know, I just called to give you my sympathy? for someone who was hurting, have a loss or something. Don't you feel better after you say that? Like, I, you know, I just call to give you my sympathy. But sympathy, sympathy puts some space between you and the person who's suffering. Okay? In other words, you realize it, you recognize it, and you feel sorry for them. But you are glad it's not you. That's sympathy. Okay? You don't necessarily feel their pain, but you can understand and feel sorry for them. Make sense? Okay. Now, um, as I said, you understand what the other person is feeling even without feeling it yourself. You understand. But let's look at empathy. Empathy is more than a f- just feeling sorry for the person. It's getting into the shoes of the person. Empathy is you putting yourself in that person's place and you actually feel what they're going through. When you look at the word empathy, that first part is actually mean in, means that you are in the suffering with them. You are deciding to get in it with them. Whatever they're going in, you're going in with them. And you are feeling what the other person is feeling. You are allowing yourself, you are getting to a place 
where you can feel what the other person feels. Now, this has been scientifically proven. This, is, this has been studied. Um, here is part of the study right here. Scientists have shown that what we have, we have what we call mirror neurons, where the neurons in your brain actually respond to what another person is going through. It's a part of the brain whose specific job is to have us mirror what's happening with someone else when it comes to their emotions. That's why I mentioned the word smile. Smile is an outward expression of an inward emotion. And if you have empathy and someone else smiles, you don't have to do anything. You will automatically smile. How many of you have you seen people and you smiled at them and they didn't smile at all? They lack empathy. They, so if you have empathy, you will respond. And so how many of you, you, when you, you know, somebody you care about and they're going through something and they're hurt and they, whatever pain they're experiencing, and you can actually feel their pain? That's empathy. That's part of the gift of the compassionate person. They have empathy, and now you feel what the other person feels. And so when you have empathy and sympathy, now you can understand what they feel with the sympathy, but you can actually also feel what they feel with the empathy. So the compassionate person pulls all this together. Compassion is in concert with those feelings of others to alleviate the pain. The, the sympathy and the empathy hasn't done anything to alleviate the pain yet. You feel it. You understand it. Compassionate means that now I am moved to do something about it. When you hear G scriptures in the New Testament, especially when it says Jesus was moved with compassion, Compassion actually moves you to take action. So empathy and sympathy, now you feel what they feel, you understand what they feel, and now you are moved to compassion. So I want to show you some scripture here as we get into this. Compassion means that your feelings have now prompted you to do something. And you are not satisfied unless you do something to relieve the pain. Your goal is to relieve the pain. So compassion means this. Is to suffer with. When you're compassionate, you can stay present with the person suffering. If you're not compassionate, you want to. You, you, if you're around pre people that are hurting and you're not, you don't have the gift of compassionate. You you can't wait to get out of there. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just not your gift. But a compassionate person can sit there all day experiencing the pain with that person. It moves you to put some time into it, to put some thought into it, to put some resources into whatever you can do to alleviate the pain. So I want to, I want to show you and tell you a, a story here. This is in the book of Luke um, where Jesus is, Jesus is, is he's, he's really on his way. Jesus is always on his way somewhere. <laughs> And so you have these people. There was this lawyer, this, this um, expert of the law. When we say see lawyer in Scripture, these are Jewish experts at the Jewish law. And they were asking Jesus these questions. So one of the lawyers came up and asked Jesus. They said, he said, what, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, you are, you are an expert at the law. What does the law of Moses tell you? And the guy said, well, the law says, love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. Now, he put two parts of the law together and got it all right. It was all correct. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. All right. And then here comes the verse that I want to introduce to you. It says, then the man, the man here is this lawyer that I'm talking about, this expert of the law. Then the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So when Jesus said, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and everything, and then love your neighbor as yourself, then the lawyer, he, he sees that, okay, I asked the question that I already knew the answer to. 
I need to ask him a question that's going to bring out something new. He's trying to trap Jesus into it, catch Jesus in a trap. And so he asked Jesus, so who is my neighbor? Now, what do you think Jesus said to him? What would you, what would you say who your neighbor is? My daddy is my neighbor. Yes, you got, got, a, got a good neighbor, um, you know, State Farm. Anyway, um, whoever is close to you. But let's look at what Jesus said. Jesus answered him, not directly, but Jesus replied with a story. He said, a, he said here's a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And this trip is about 17 miles, and it's actually a dangerous part of the road. Even at the time the scriptures were written, even today, it's not a good place to be somewhere by yourself. Okay? It's a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Now, typically, well-to-do people travel from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, the people who served in the temple at Jerusalem, that would be like the priests, the people who worked in the temple, people. And so they were a good person to catch, to steal from, to beat up, to take their stuff. So you need to be careful if you were on this road. Um, they take your money, your clothes, your Nikes, whatever you got. They were going to take it. That was, their, that was their goal. to sit, be. They would hide out in the caves just so that they could take this. And Jesus went on with the story, and he said, by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw, now priests, who is the priest? The priest is like the top of the religious order for Jews, right? That's, there's, no, there's nobody higher than the high priest. But then the priest, that's the highest order. So Jesus said, the priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Now, let me ask you this. Did the priest see the person? The scripture tells us he saw him, right? The priest, the preacher, saw the man half dead on the side of the road. So he looked at him and moved to the other side of the road. All right? And then he said, then a temple assistant, if you have... King James Version, it says a Levite. That's another person who works in the temple. These are people, some people can't even go in the temple. But this is, this is why Jesus uses this. When Jesus says he gives these kind of stories, you need some kind of backdrop. So you realize that these Jews who's listening to this, they realize that Gentiles are not even allowed in the temple. Okay. Women can go in, but only to a certain place. Slaves couldn't go in, only to a certain place. If you were blind, there were places in the temple you couldn't go. If you were lame. So these Jews, especially this expert of the law, he knows who's not supposed to be in the temple. And Jesus is saying, the priest came by and saw this man, laying on, this Jewish man, lying on the side of the road, and he looked at him and he walked away. Then he says, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him. Now, this guy walked over to the guy and looked at him. But what? He also passed by to the other side. Mm. So they both saw the person. They both could have had sympathy, right? Could have felt sorry for him. Have you ever just passed by somebody you felt sorry for them, but you didn't, <laughs> didn't do anything? You were on your way somewhere else? Like these people, they were on their way somewhere else. And they didn't have enough empathy to feel what he was feeling. Maybe the second person did, because he went over and looked at him, and he just said, hmm, I, I, I got to go. He just left. So they left him there. But look at what Jesus, how Jesus painted this picture. He said, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, so they all three saw the man. When he saw the man, 
He felt compassion for him. So when he saw him, he felt more than sympathy. He felt more than empathy. He felt compassion. He put all of those things together. This is, but look at how Jesus is painting this picture. The Samaritans couldn't go in the temple either. As, as a matter of fact, the Samaritans were nowhere near the temple. They were hated by the Jews. They wouldn't let them know where it was hard to get a Samaritan in Jerusalem. So let alone, you know, in the temple. And so Jesus says, here comes a despised Samaritan, someone that you despise. Here comes a despised Samaritan. He came along and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Then going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to, the, to an inn where he took care of him. So here you have a stranger, a despised stranger, who comes to a Jewish man who's suffering that two other Jewish people who are at the top of the religious order in the Jewish rank pass by. They said he half dead. Now, there could have been a reason. I shouldn't just, you know, smooth over that like that. Part of the Jewish law is if someone is, they're not supposed to touch dead people. They're not supposed to touch dead people. So when they get to the point where you are half dead, they couldn't think that the person could be half alive. <laughs> He's half dead. I'm, I'm done with my temple duties for the day. I am heading back home. But this Samaritan actually took the man Put him on his donkey. Now he's not on the donkey now. He's got the, the wounded man on the donkey. He's walking and he took him to an uh, inn, like a hotel, where he took care of the man, took care of him for a whole day. And then it says the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So here you have this man. He's obviously known by the innkeeper because he's, he's trustworthy. He can actually say, you know, just take care of him. If it's more than what I've already paid you, I'll pay you the next time that I come through here. But here comes a man who's a despised Samaritan who actually bandages up the man's wounds, takes care of the man, takes him, not... I mean, picks him up, put him on his donkey, takes him to an inn and takes care of him for a day and then tells the innkeeper that I'll, I'm paying you this money now to, till this man is better. But if you run out of money before he's better, I'll give you more money when I come back through. Then Jesus asked this question. This is the question. He said, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? And I know you all know the answer, right? You know it was who? Now, you all answer correctly, but did you know that this lawyer, he was so angry and despised Samaritan so much that he could not get the word Samaritan out of his mouth. When Jesus said, which one? Because Jesus told him it was a priest, it was a temple worker, and a despised Samaritan. Which of the three were a neighbor to the Jewish man who was hurt? The man, and the man being the Jewish expert, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. But Jesus didn't attack him. I mean, it seems like Jesus would say, couldn't you just say the Samaritan? The man who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said this. Jesus said, yes, that's the right one. But he says, now you, Jewish man, go and do like this despised Samaritan. That's when you understand love. Go be like this despised Samaritan and you can have eternal life. That's what real love is. 
So to move from empathy to compassion, here's a couple things, and then we'll wrap this up. To move from empathy to compassion, it's really all about listening. When you can listen, number one, without judgment. Listen without judgment. Not, in other words, you're not ready to jump in and tell the judge and tell the person. Listen intent, with intention and attention. Give the person your attention. Not, you know, your intention is to listen. Your intention, I'm just here to listen. I'm not here to give you an advice, which brings you to the next one. Listen without advice. Don't just wait for a chance to talk so you can tell the person what they need to do. This is empathy. And listen with understanding and listen with vulnerability. Vulnerability means that it, perhaps you might have something to share if, it, if it's appropriate. If you have a similar situation uh, where you feel their pain and you can say, here's what I did. That's vulnerability. So all of this pulls out of you the love that God has on the inside of you. But the worst, this was like the worst condition for this Jewish lawyer. And God, Jesus had to show him what should have come out. And so here's your challenge today is to expand your scope of friendships by at least one person this week. Expand your scope of friendship by at least one person this week. That's one part of it. And go deeper with at least one person that you now have as a casual friend. Okay? So expand, be, be broader by one, and take one person that's already a friend deeper. Make sense? I'm going to pray for you. So we, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can do this. Okay. Here's, the, here's our implementation intention. I always have, you know, we need to implement what the scripture is telling us to do. So we always talk about doing life together, right? That's part of our model. That's who we are. We do life together. So doing life together with real friends require real contact. Okay? I know we're in this virtual world, this digital world, and, you know, and we call it social media. You know what social media is? It's, it's media, <laughs> It's, it's, it's not life. It's, it's like a mass production of information. It's media. It, it can be, it can complement real relationships, but it should never be a substitute. But what we have done, especially since COVID, what we have done is we, we use it instead of we use it in place of, and we only have these surface relationships, these surface friends. How many? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> How many of you have over 100 friends on Facebook? Okay. How many of you have over 500 friends on Facebook? How many of you have over 1,000 friends on Facebook? How many of you have over 2,000 friends on Facebook? How many of you have over 5,000 friends on Facebook? Take one of those and go deeper <laughs> this week. All right? So here's how we can do that. Here's one way that we can do this. This week, find some time, two or three ways to be together in person with the people that you love and with those who love you. Find a way this week to do that, to be with the person. Find two or three ways to do it, to be with the person that some people that you love, I'm not just saying anybody, but to be with someone that you love Find a way to do that. And then practice using technology 
to complement your relationships, but not to replace, you know, your interaction with the person, replacing the, you know, um, in-person FaceTime with social media. Don't, don't do that. And so wrapping this up, your implementation action traits to practice this week is be a good listener and be moved to alleviate pain. Now, let me pray for you. I know we all need some prayer after this one, right? But these are gifts that God has given us, and we need to express these gifts and learn and walk in them. So bow your heads with me, if you would, please. Father, we thank you today. You've been so good to us, and you have shown your love to us. We thank you for all of the different expressions of your love that we've um, perceived and that we have interacted with, that we have uh, engaged in. And today, Father, I just ask that you would move on our hearts to release that love that you've already given us into the heart so other hearts can experience that same love, so they could be touched, they could feel that we feel their pain and feel whatever they're going through, that we might release your love that can actually encompass, they, they will be able to encompass your love in their own situations that will bring glory to your name and actually bring peace and joy to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.